Well, good morning. It's almost 11 o'clock. Um, and I'm sort of not quite sure what I'm doing this morning, but um, it was really just till Graham got um, everything going. For those of you who will be watching this later, not in and are not in Victoria, and certainly for any overseas, we're back into a five-day lockdown. We hope only five days, um, so we're not allowed to meet. It's a very strict lockdown. I'm sure you can find out about it on the internet. So we're back to streaming as we were in 2020, but hopefully only for one Sunday. So welcome, and I'll hand over to Graham now. Well, thank you, Christine, for being first cab off the rank of, of the two of us. Um, and welcome to our stream service this morning. Um, the notices uh, today are in the leaflet, which uh, I expect will be online already. Uh, and they are basically that next Wednesday, because we're in a four, stage four lockdown, which is due to to be reviewed on Wednesday. Uh, there will be no uh, gathered prayer meeting. If you want to have a note of the things that we will be circulating to pray about as a, as a church, and you want to join us at 1.30 wherever you are in your prayers, then please email me and I'll send you the prayer email. The other thing is that that Wednesday, first Wednesday, is Ash Wednesday, the start of Lent. And this year, for the first time, I've decided to uh, send out a daily email through Lent for anybody who, who would like a copy of it. So these will be drawn on the writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German pastor during the Nazi period in Germany and who was executed uh, just before the end of the Second World War. So if you would like to read what he wrote about life together as Christians in that hostile situation, uh, I invite you to uh, let me know by email, uh, phone call, uh, and I'll make sure you're on the list for those daily emails throughout Lent. Now, that's all the notices. Shall we just begin this as time of uh, worship with prayer? Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Almighty God, now, a week ago, we didn't expect to be isolated in our homes by a stage four lockdown. We were sort of calmly getting back to a more optimistic uh, sense of our freedoms, and now we have to stop the virulent uh, version of the virus that has been causing mayhem in our societies around the world. And so we pray that this lockdown will effectively uh, contain the virus and that people might be spared the kinds of illness uh, that it's been causing. And so, Father, we ask that as we worship you remotely in our homes, that you would still connect us through uh, your spirit to offer our praise and adoration to Jesus. And we ask that this might be the experience of Christian people everywhere, whether they are able to gather or not, we ask that there will be a great sense of adoration of the Lord Jesus as we think about him and what he has done. So draw near to us and accept our worship for his name's sake. Amen. Now Christine is going to bring us young at heart. Thank you, Christine. Well, um... I've entitled this The Best Laid Plans, which is probably quite an appropriate title for those in Victoria. Those of you who know me know I am a planner and a list maker from way back. I look at the year ahead, the month ahead, the week ahead, and then have a list for each day. I could argue that this has been necessary for most of my, of my adult life, as, like all of us, I seem to have always been juggling separate hats. However, I think it's probably also a matter of temperament. 
For example, I have a permanent list of what Graham and I should take if we go out of town for a couple of nights, cause you, especially because we usually do self-catering. I had a similar list for family holidays and for day trips to the snow and for day trips to the beach when we went windsurfing. That was in part because if one piece of equipment was left behind, the whole skiing or windsurfing activity might not be able to happen. Our offspring used to laugh and roll their eyes at some of my plans. They were often for what I considered educational reasons. For example, one night when the kids were quite little and we were staying at the prom, I booked us in to join a night hike starting at 9pm, which was well past their bedtime, with the goal of seeing nocturnal animals. It had been raining, so the bush was wet. I'm sorry, we should have thought to have a picture of the prom. But anyway, it had been raining, so the bush was wet, it was cold, and I think the Australian nocturnal animals had the sense to stay well out of view. But one animal was sighted, not a native, and it was sighted by one member of the family, namely me. I saw a deer, one deer, which of course is not native. One of the most famous poems of Robert Burns, the Scottish poet, is to a mouse. And he noted that he wrote it on turning up her nest, or turning her up in her nest with the plough in November 1785. It's a beautiful, poignant poem, and possibly the most famous line is, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang aft a glee, which being translated means the best laid schemes of mice and men often go wrong. Surely these are apt words to describe the announcement on Friday that we in Victoria, in the whole of Victoria, were going into a snap five-day lockdown. A decision made by the federal government with the, sorry, made by the Victorian government with the support of the federal government due to the virulent nature of what we um, lay people are calling the UK variant of COVID-19. I noticed yesterday that the experts are using another name because none of us want to be seeming to blame the UK. It was first identified there, it wasn't created there. Even in our family, this meant the cancellation of several events including a granddaughter's 21st, the first communion of a, of a grandson, and of course, as I look around this morning, the cancellation of face-to-face -face church, which we had all been enjoying. We hope and pray that this outbreak will be soon brought under control and that we'll all be back together next Sunday. I think we don't need the, the list there. Graham had a wedding scheduled in the Little John Chapel at Scotch College for yesterday, Saturday. Thankfully, the rehearsal scheduled for Friday was able to become the wedding. All but interstate guests, interstate guests were in attendance. They, didn't, they had decided not to come in case they had to quarantine when they went back. And, amazingly, and happily, the reception venue could accommodate the 24-hour change. So they were all very happy and were aware that so many, many people with weddings planned for yesterday couldn't make the turnaround. So in the midst of all this, I began to think about God's plans for us, which cannot be thwarted by any pandemic. I think you know by now that one of my favourite verses is Ephesians 2.10 
with the reference to good works which God has already planned for us to do. But also let's think of Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So let us draw hope from this assurance, especially when our lives are turned upside down and not by a five-day lockdown, but by a serious accident, bereavement, job loss, serious illness, relationship problems, whatever. Remember, God has plans to give us hope and a future. His plans will never harm us. They will give us hope and a future. May we all be strengthened now and always by that assurance. Thank you. And unusually now, since we've been back, I'm also doing the Bible reading, which is from John chapter 13, verses 1 to 17. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It was now the day before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. He had always loved those in the world who were his own, and he loved them to the very end. Jesus and his disciples were at supper. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, the thought of betraying Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him complete power. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God. So he rose from the table, took off his outer garment and tied a towel around his waist. Then he poured some water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel round his waist. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Are you going to wash my feet, Lord? Jesus answered him, You do not understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later. Peter declared, Never at any time will you wash my feet. If I do not wash your feet, Jesus answered, you will no longer be my disciple. Simon Peter answered, Lord, do not wash only my feet then, wash my hands and my head too. Jesus said, Anyone who has had a bath is completely clean and does not have to wash himself except for his feet. All of you are clean, all except one. Jesus already knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, All of you except one are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet, he put his outer garment back on and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I have just done? he asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and it is right that you do so, because that is what I am. I, your Lord and teacher, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you, so that you will do just what I have done for you. I'm telling you the truth. No slave is greater than his master, and no messenger is greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know this truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice.
May God bless his word to us. Thank you, Christine. It's uh, one of my favorite passages of scripture. I often uh, think about what Jesus chose to say and do on this, his last night with his disciples. That's Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. In thinking about this morning, I was doing some reading and I, I was also looking around for some kind of image that I might use to uh, put on the front of the leaflet uh, and use on the screen. Uh, and so I found this image, uh, Christ Washing the Disciples' Feet by Tintoretto. Uh, you can download it from the church's website. This image is from the National Gallery in London and uh, uh, the National Gallery in London. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a large image, but I discovered uh, from Wikipedia, no less, that, we, that Tintoretto did uh, at least six uh, images of Christ uh, washing his disciples' feet. And Wikipedia suggests that it may have been because of the challenge of such a complex image, a challenge of trying to get the angle, location of people, how he might imagine it to take place. But as I read on through the article, and I, especially the person, the section of the uh, article which dealt with Tintoretto's character, uh, I, I couldn't help wondering if this reputedly undemanding and generous man took something more challenging from the story in John's Gospel, chapter 13. It clearly has the phrase, one another. You possibly were watching for it when Christine was reading to you. You then should wash one another's feet. And I want to suggest to you that uh, Jesus is presenting to us the mind of a servant. And the implications are profound, but also practical. And so uh, we're looking then at this word, alelon, the Greek word, which means one another. And I've taken just a sliver of the painting because you can see it's a very wide painting. In fact, some of these paintings were done as frescoes in churches. And of the six that we know of, uh, only two remain in Italian churches. The rest are in galleries in other parts of the world. And as I said, this one in London. So I've taken this sliver uh, from the image, Jesus washing the feet of Peter and I want to pick up on three headings, uh, which I think are, help us get to the, 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 the substance of this passage. Firstly, I want to notice the Passover protest to Jesus. Right? So it is a Passover service, and there is a protest in this narrative. The second thing is the puzzling crosswork of Jesus. And then finally, I want to think about enlisted servants of Jesus Christ. So three headings and uh, let's get to the first one. The Passover protest to Jesus. John chapter 13 verse 1 makes it very clear that this is a significant hour, a very uh, significant hour for Jesus. It was the day before the Passover festival and Jesus knew that his hour had come. In John's gospel you get this movement towards the hour. Uh, you'll find several time references. And now the hour has come. What, you might ask, hour is this? Well, I think we know because we're familiar with the, where the gospel is going. And I've already said that this was Jesus last night. In the world of the Roman Empire, of course, social status was strictly hierarchical. The emperor was divine. Roman citizens were privileged. Women and children mattered less. And... Uh, the men and slaves were at the bottom of the pile and were expendable. In this social climate, there were very strict protocols about what should be done. Typically, before a meal, uh, the second lowest uh, status slave in a family would wash the feet or would undo the sandals of, uh, of the visitors to the, to the house. And the lowest slave, the lowest ranking slave, would wash their feet. Now, that was in the Roman Empire. But we're looking at a group of 
Jewish people in the Roman Empire and in Israel the Jews were given a certain amount of freedom. The Romans didn't actually manage it for themselves, they found that very difficult so they subcontracted that to the Herod family. And so there was still hierarchy going on. It was almost impossible for human beings not to have that sense of some people more important than others. And so we know from the Gospels that the disciples even argued about this. Jesus was talking about a kingdom. Where would they be in the kingdom? What status would they have? So they were arguing about that on the road. So they, the disciples of Jesus also were, had these hierarchical ideas about what, what mattered most. And this scene, the day before the Passover festival, this meal has monumental significance. The hour has come. It appears no one had taken it upon themselves to wash anyone's feet here. And Jesus embraced this moment. He took off his outer garment and he wrapped a towel apron around himself and took a basin of water and started washing his disciples' feet. Stunned and perhaps humiliated, it seems that no one spoke until Jesus came to Peter. That was a catalyst. True to form, Peter protested, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? To this Jesus replied, and notice these words, you don't understand this now but you will later. What's going on? Was this just a lesson in humility? C.S. Lewis has this beautiful statement about humility. It's not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. And I think that's a, it's a lovely statement. But is that what Jesus is doing here? Is it just a lesson in humility? I want to suggest to you that he's going deeper. He's taking us to the cross. So it's not just humility. He's leading us to what we're on the cusp of here. The hour has come for him to be delivered up. And so uh, this washing uh, needs is much more than a lesson in humility. And the dialogue with Peter makes this clear. It's much more than a usual act of courtesy. Jesus is saying it is essential for his disciples to be washed by him essential. Well then, thought Peter, if it's essential, not just my feet, but my head and my hands, wash all of me. But Jesus is saying, no, that's, that's not necessary. This is only something you will understand later, afterwards, after the cross. This washing was not at the commencement of the meal. They hadn't just begun the meal. They were already at the Passover. And it was in the middle of Passover that Jesus engaged in this action, this deeply symbolic action. It's a kind of uh, acted parable, says Leon Morris. A parable in action, setting out that great principle of lowly service, which finds its supreme embodiment in the cross. The cross, you see, is necessary because God is working forgiveness into human history and it's not a simple matter. It's not just forgive and forget. It's complex because sin damages things. It damages people. And it damages the world. It's as if the whole world is groaning with the burden of human corruption. And it might just, we might just want to lightly pass it off and say, well, that's no problem. But God is engaged in bearing the penalty in Christ. Many today want to admire Jesus' life and to praise how sublime his moral standards were and his teaching techniques, but, says A.M. Hunter, they cannot bring themselves to believe that Christ died for their sins. In uh, in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul explains this in a very straightforward statement. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Christ, our Passover, has suffered for us. Christ has suffered for us. He is the Passover. So as they're eating the Passover, Jesus gives it a totally new significance. He is the one who is suffering for us. And this is the scandal of the cross. 
We don't want to believe that what we do could require some kind of atonement by the Son of God. And why would God do that for me? And this is a stumbling point. In thinking about this, I was reading several websites where people say Jesus was a great religious teacher and someone to follow, a moral exemplar, but they do not believe it was necessary that anyone would die for their sins. They omit the cross. The sites I looked at deny that Jesus' relationship with God was unique to himself. Although they call themselves Christians, they assert that Jesus is just one way among many. And they use elevated Christian language, but they leave out altogether the language of the cross. I've observed this over quite a number of years. Uh, back when I was a school chaplain, I received a set of hymns from someone who had uh, adjusted the hymns for the modern era. And he had taken old hymns and left out all the references to the cross and rephrased them. I've also had elders come to, an elder come to me and, uh, and ask why it's necessary to talk about the cross. And I couldn't help wondering, and indeed I challenged this elder, what does communion mean to you if you take this cup and this cup represents Christ's blood shed for us? And I think he went away with a puzzle in his head. You see, there are some people who want the name of Christian, but they would never say, as the Apostle Paul does in Galatians 2.20, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Never would they say with Peter, Lord, if I have to be washed by you, wash me totally. Make me wholly clean. And that's exactly what Peter in his enthusiasm to be 100% for Jesus, went on to say. So then, when Jesus is washing his disciples' feet and is teaching them about being made clean as his disciples, he's got the cross in mind. It's looming large on his horizon, as all the Gospels make clear. And so we come to then ask ourselves, what does this mean for us? Well, I want to suggest it means two things. Firstly, there is a kind of infection that contaminates all our best thoughts and actions. The Bible has many words to describe this. Um, on the wedding that I took on Friday, not Saturday, because of the sudden lockdown, uh, I was standing waiting for the bride with the groomsman and the, the, the groom, and uh, we were in an as a side room at the Scotch Chapel. And the boys were flicking, the young men, flicking through the order of service. And they said, oh, it's got the, the, you know, the words of the Lord's Prayer, trespasses. And uh, when I was at school, we used a version which used the word sin. And these guys obviously preferred the word trespasses. And so I was talking to them about the different words that are used to translate this problem that the Bible calls sin. Sin is like falling short of something. It sort of comes from, if you think of archery, you fire an arrow and it doesn't reach the target. That's us. We've got God's standards in front of us, but we don't reach them. The word in the Lord's Prayer that I grew up with as a child was debtors. And that has the idea of financial shortfall. So forgive us our debts. So uh, the, another word is iniquity. And the Bible uses the word iniquity, and, and iniquity has to do with crookedness. And, you know, when you're feeling a bit crook, you're not yourself, you're not the way you want to be. And when the Bible uses iniquity, it suggests there's a crookedness within us. And another word is transgressions. Forgive us our, trans, our trespasses. And trespasses is where we go across a, a boundary. We transgress where we shouldn't be. And there are other words as well. That conversation, I have to say, took 60 seconds. It was brief. But it was interesting that they were ready to hear about their favoured words in the, in the Lord's Prayer. And so, no matter how much we try, we can't escape this idea that as human beings, there is a shortfall in our lives. The problem, sin, is not so much out there, it's in here. 
There is a story, uh, I used to believe it, but I'd, I think it's most likely apocryphal now, that the Times newspaper asked readers to explain what was wrong with the world, and one responded with a very short letter. It said, Dear Sir, I am yours, G.K. Chesterton. Now, it's, it's a, <laughs> this little story has achieved such wide circulation because it seems to be so typical of that man, G.K. Chesterton. In fact, he actually wrote a book on what was wrong with the world. But, but the truth of the story is that the problem lies within each of us. And the same idea surfaces in another book, which I think I'm going to have to read, The Gulag Archipelago. I've read about this book, I've read extracts from it, but it's given we've got another lockdown, maybe I'll have time to pick up another book. And in this book, which is uh, an overview of things that happen in the Soviet penal system in his lifetime, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Nobel-winning uh, literary uh, figure, says, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart. At the cross of Christ, we're offered personal forgiveness. This is the sanitizing station the whole world needs. John says, chapter 13, verse 1, he loved them to the end. You see, the end is in view right through this chapter. And the washing of his disciples' feet is... is uh, his humility coming down and down, but it's going way beyond their feet. It's going to take him to Calvary. So that's the first thing. We need to face up to the infection that contaminates us and our own need of cleansing. We need to be washed by Jesus. And the second thing that I want to say as a consequence of this is that Jesus inviting us here to enlist as his servants. You too should wash one another's feet. Those who have been washed by Jesus, their servant master, themselves need to engage in active service. They have to take up the towel and the basin. They have to become humble and serve one another. Numerous one another passages in the New Testament letters show this. The one that I, that I had in mind was Galatians 3 verse 5. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amazing idea that I, that I would take somebody else's problem, somebody else's burden, the weight from somebody else and carry it. But if we are one body, it doesn't become so amazing. The great hymn in uh, Philippians chapter 2 it takes us to that place where the very song of heaven is going to be about the lamb, the Passover lamb who was slain. And in Paul's letter to the Philippians he says this, he always had the nature of God but he did not think that by force he should try to become equal with God instead of this of his own free will, he gave up all that he had and took the nature of a servant and become, became a man and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and he walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above all. Uh, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and all fall on their knees and proclaim that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the hymn in praise of Christ that emerges in Paul's understanding of the death of Jesus. It, it invites him to write to the early churches and say, serve one another. 
And it comes back to Christ's service of us and his washing of us, his making us clean. This is a call to action, really. And the invitation here is to list, to enlist consciously on the side of Christ and in the cause of Christ and as a disciple of Jesus. You want to be a disciple of Jesus? Enlist. Let him wash you and walk with him. Take his yoke upon you and learn of him. He is the one who has given this name above every name. May God help us all, not just to take up the towel of humility, but to do so because we have been made clean by a Savior who has brought forgiveness to us and invites us into his company. I'm going to invite you now to join in prayer. As usual, I've scripted a few things to pray for, and uh, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we have sinned against you, and we have done what is evil in your sight. We're sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. We thank you that in the person of your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, you came to serve a lost and rebellious world. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation through Christ our Lord. He humbled himself to embrace our humanity and as a man subjected himself to the whims of lawless men, he experienced rejection, cruelty, and a shameful death, even that death on a cross. Thank you that he is now exalted in your presence and our Savior and Redeemer. We confess that our deeds have not shown a humility like his. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again and ask you to have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who were once dead but now have life through Christ our Lord. We acknowledge the humble service of a great diversity of people with skills working to contain the virus that so threatens our communities and changes our behaviours. We ask that they will slow its spread and develop treatments and vaccines that protect people. We have never seen so many people working so comprehensively for the welfare of society and we thank you. We ask that the vaccines that are to begin rollout here in Victoria this month will quickly have a significant impact in helping the most vulnerable people and that as needed, they will not only be effectively manufactured and distributed, but also adapted as the virus mutates to address the needs of people everywhere. In this pandemic, we come to you again asking that the various more virulent strains of the virus will be contained, and as a result of the current stage four lockdown in our state, we will all benefit. We pray again that the tide will turn on the pandemic and that especially the poorer nations will not be overlooked and that the World Health Organization and the COVAX agreement will enable them to get the protections that they need. We know that the race is not won until we all cross the finish line. At this time, after the freeing of his Canadian and Australian Al Jazeera colleagues. We're grateful for the release of Mahmoud Hussein. Thank you for the role of honest and truthful reporting. We pray for all journalists unjustly imprisoned in regimes which seek to hide their deeds from the public. Thinking of China, Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Eritrea, Vietnam, Iran and Russia as the top of the list. We are amazed that there are more than 250 journalists in detention and we pray for their safety. We pray for the opening up of countries that are currently oppressive. 
We pray for those we know who are troubled with ill health and uncertainty. Many of them are elderly, and, but some are young, and help each and all whom we lift to you in the quiet of our hearts now. Some who might have been here with us, some who have been here with us in the past, and others whom we know through other networks and associations. We pray for them now. Follow with your blessing the proclamation of the gospel wherever Jesus is exalted today. Encourage all who bear witness to his salvation. And these things we ask in his name and for his glory, saying together as he taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you Lord, lift upon you the light of his countenance and give you peace. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love now and always. <laughs>